The successful flight of Starship SN15 was a huge milestone for the entire Starship program. And the next logical step for SpaceX is to conduct an orbital flight test. This is exactly what they plan to do with Starship SN20. And as you might have already guessed, when jumping from a suborbital flight to an orbital one, a launch vehicle needs to go through some major upgrades, both in terms of flight profile and hardware. So in this video, we'll take a look into two such major upgrades that differentiates SN20 from its predecessors. Before jumping into the upgrades though, I think there are a few questions that needs to be answered first. Based on the flight timeline that SpaceX released a few weeks ago, it is certain that Starship SN20 will technically not reach orbit. A spacecraft is considered to have reached orbit if its perigee or the closest point to the surface of Earth is above a certain altitude. The United States and NASA considers 80 kilometers as the boundary of space, while the internationally accepted boundary of space is 100 kilometers, also known as the Kármán line. So for Starship to be technically in orbit, its perigee needs to be above either 80 or 100 kilometers. And based on the flight profile that we have seen, SN20 just won't do that. And it makes complete sense. Consider a scenario where Starship reaches orbit, and in an unfortunate turn of events, SpaceX loses communication with the prototype. In this case, SN20 will remain in low Earth orbit and slowly deorbit due to atmospheric drag. This means SpaceX will unintentionally end up doing a China-like stunt with a huge rocket stage undergoing an uncontrolled re-entry. And I'm pretty sure that none of you would like to see a 100-ton piece of stainless steel crash land in your backyard. So SN20 will technically be suborbital flight. Going with this flight trajectory will allow SpaceX to test Starship in near-orbital conditions and at the same time ensure safety. So with this clear, let's take a look at the first major upgrade for Starship SN20, and that is the Vacuum Raptors or RVAC. Starship SN20 will be the first prototype to demonstrate in-flight use of Vacuum Raptors. SpaceX's Starship is designed to have up to 6 engines, 3 sea levels and 3 vacuum optimized versions of Raptors. Up until now, all the Starship prototypes have only used sea level Raptors, but SN20 will carry an additional 3 vacuum optimized versions. You see, the traditional bell nozzle engines are designed to function efficiently at certain altitudes. The sea level Raptors, for example, are designed to function at peak efficiency near the sea level. The rocket engines perform at high efficiency when the pressure from the exhaust plume is equal to the outside pressure, also called the ambient pressure. And as you might know, as we go higher in altitude, the atmospheric pressure decreases. You can see this difference in pressure here. As Starship reaches higher altitudes, the pressure from the exhaust plume is higher than the ambient pressure. As a result, you can see the expansion of exhaust plume going on. This actually decreases the efficiency of the rocket engine. So in order to solve this, all the modern rockets have multiple stages, with engines in each stage designed to function efficiently in certain environments. In Starship and Super Heavy's case, the Super Heavy booster will have 29 sea level Raptors as it will predominantly function in atmospheric conditions. However, the second stage, Starship, will also work in the vacuum of space, so it will need some vacuum optimized engines. The vacuum optimized Raptors will have this extended nozzle. This extended nozzle will decrease the pressure from the exhaust plume. This in turn will increase the efficiency of the Raptor engines. You can see in this graph that how the rocket engines with larger nozzle diameters have higher specific impulse at higher altitudes. In simple terms, ISP is just the major of efficiency of an engine. However, if you want to know more about this, do consider watching my video on Raptor engines after this one. Moving on, the next major difference between Starship SN20 and SN15 will be the number of heat shield tiles on the prototype. If you have been closely following the Starship development, you might know that with every new prototype, SpaceX is increasing the number of heat shield tiles on them. This is to test whether the heat shield tiles remain attached to the prototype during flight. With SN20, Starship will have the entire levered side covered with the heat shields. During an atmospheric re-entry, a spacecraft can have energy in range of 13 megajoules per kilogram. That's more than three times that of TNT. But the good part here is that the majority of this energy is absorbed by the atmosphere and not by the spacecraft. When a spacecraft re-enters in the Earth's atmosphere at hypersonic speeds, the particles of the atmosphere just can't get out of the way easily. This leads to the formation of a shock wave which creates extreme pressures and by extension, temperatures. For instance, you can see this heat map of the space shuttle. During re-entry, the shockwave is closer to the tip of the spacecraft. As a result, the temperature there is also higher. The same will be the case with Starship. During SN20's re-entry, the tip of the nose cone and the joints and edges of the aerodynamic flaps will experience higher temperatures. As a result, there will be some more heat shield tiles covering this region 
extending all the way to the back of Starship. This amazing illustration by Alexander Swan clearly shows how the heat distribution during Starship's re-entry might look like. You can clearly see how the tip of the nose cone and the edges of the flap will have to endure more temperatures compared to the body of the rocket. Again, if you want to know more about the heat shields of Starship specifically, do consider watching my video on this exact topic. So with these two major upgrades, it is clear that SN20 will be the most complete Starship prototype that we have seen so far. And these are just two of the many incremental upgrades that Starship SN20 will have over its predecessors. It is extremely possible that the probability of success of SN20 is even less than that of SN8. If you remember, no one expected SN8 to be as successful as it was. So similarly, it is also possible that SN20 might just surprise everyone and survive all the way up to re-entry or even better, end up soft landing on the ocean. However, whatever be the outcome, SN20's test will just be an extension of the ongoing iterative development process at SpaceX. What do you think? What will be the outcome of Starship SN20? Let me know in the comment section. If you are new here, do consider subscribing the channel. Thanks for watching. Have a nice day.